Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Baker Keffer, and I'm Vice President with The Atlantic, and wanted to thank you all for being here for this morning's session, Developing a Sustainable Economy in the Middle East. One uh, administrative note tying to a different session that I was asked to make is that there is a luncheon today called Government 2.0. That luncheon is today. If you have a ticket to it, the tickets were mislabeled as July 4th, but it is today, July 3rd, the Government 2.0 luncheon. So on to this session, Developing a Sustainable Economy in the Middle East. The moderator for today's session is Donald Presley, who is the Vice President with Booz Allen Hamilton. He leads the firm's diplomacy and international development business, providing services to emerging uh, market economies focused in four areas, government transformation, economic performance, citizen services, and humanitarian support. His primary focus is on using new technologies and methodologies to help develop, developing nations improve and expand their capacities to become productive parts of the global society and economy. And prior to Booz Allen Hamilton, Don was a senior foreign service officer at the U.S. Agency for International Development. So a very strong background to lead this morning's conversation on developing a sustainable economy in the Middle East. So I'll turn things over to Don and his group. Thank you. Elizabeth, thank you very much. We have a, a very distinguished panel to um, talk on this topic this morning. Let me just frame the, um, the topic for a moment and then I'll introduce our panelists briefly and ask them to react to the, to the theme of this morning's topic. The economic wealth currently possessed by the Middle East is unparalleled throughout the world. Over the past 10 years, the region has generated an unprecedented 2.5 trillion in revenues derived from its oil. But paradoxically, the region has also received approximately 82 billion in foreign assistance over the same time frame. Both wealth from oil and income from foreign aid have generated a dependency on an arguably unsustainable source of income. And the question is, has the Middle East the opportunity to find a viable replacement for these dependencies on outside sources of wealth? The economist predicts that the known reserves of oil in the region will expire within only 40 years. And aid income depends upon governments that must examine their foreign aid programs, and they can be fickle in this, in this regard. So the question that I want to pose to our panelists today is whether the governments of the region or the corporations that are operating in the region have given thought to the ability to attain economic sustainability, and primarily through two alternative mechanisms, achieving foreign investment and achieving innovation as alternative ways to create sustainable in economies in the Middle East. Now, as I mentioned, we have a, a very esteemed set of panelists here this morning to uh, talk to this subject. Immediately to my right is His Excellency Aziz Makwar. He's ambassador of His Majesty the King of Morocco to the United States. During his tenure as ambassador, Ambassador Makwar has overseen the negotiation and signing of a free trade agreement between Morocco and the United States. Previously, Ambassador McGuire was the chairman of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and he's represented the Kingdom of Morocco as ambassador to Italy, Malta, Albania, Portugal, and Angola. Certainly someone that has um, uh, seen how sustainable economies can be developed in many parts of the world. To his right is His Excellency Karim Kawar, Kareem is currently the president of the Coar Group and the former ambassador to the United States and Mexico from Jordan. He is also chairman of Coar Energy and of Iris Guard. As ambassador to the United States, Ambassador Coar led the Idama Initiative, and I'm sure he's going to tell us a little bit more about that. He's also the architect of the REACH Initiative, Jordan's blueprint for a knowledge economy. He's founder and chairman of the Information Technology Association of Jordan, former president of the Jordan Computer Society, 
and someone who really understands both business and government. And then we also have with us Shepard Hill. Shepard is president of Boeing International and a member of the company's executive council. Shep oversees Boeing's international affairs and has responsibility for 20 Boeing in-country operations throughout the world. Previously, he was senior vice president of Boeing's business development and strategy, where he was responsible for analyzing and developing plans to drive growth and nurture new businesses. So we have today a wealth of experience and perspective on this question of whether the Middle East can find new ways to uh, achieve sustainable economies. Shep, let me start with you. If you could just give us from your perspective as a uh, leader of an international business, what do you think of this question and um, how is Boeing addressing it? Well, I think it's a very valid question, obviously. As a result of population growth in this region, uh, the World Bank estimates, estimates that the Arab world will have to create between 55 and 70 million jobs over the next 20 years. <clears throat> that is in a region that right now has one of the lowest employment rates around the world. And some analysts indicate that in the uh, cohort of 15 to 24 years old, that that unemployment rate could be as high as 25% or in excess of that. <clears throat> Within the GCC, oil represents 47% of the GDP, but only about 1% of the employment. So what that clearly points to is to have a sustainable economic growth going forward that employs and creates the jobs, it needs to diversify uh, going forward. And diversification is key. I know your own Booz Allen Don has done a study just recently on diversification and what that means to this region. From our standpoint, the key ingredients to that diversification will be taking some of that oil money, some of that investment, and putting it into human capital, education, technology, innovation going forward. Uh, from our perspective in Boeing, we see the nations uh, in this region as understanding that. Uh, putting money toward education, in particular human capital, uh, raising the level of skills and capability, and desiring to partner with companies like Boeing and other multinationals to have knowledge transfer, to have technology transfer, and to uh, paint a vision forward for this growing cohort of people that is already in the schools and coming forward. I think the one item of, uh, of concern that has to be monitored is that commitment has to stay whether oil is at 40 or at 90. And I think in certain places, it's easy to revert back to the extraction kind of industry focus. But I think there's legitimate uh, visions that have been put forth by the governments in the area to focus <coughs> on that diversification. Aziz, uh, what's your perspective on this? Well, uh, first of all, I think your question is very interesting. Uh, the, uh, the fact uh, that Karim and myself are here, we are the two countries that have no oil, oil. so we don't have any oil. So we can speak very freely. <laughs> we have no oil, no gas, so we had to, to do without oil and gas. Um, the other question was about foreign aid. <clears throat> well, I looked at the numbers, and actually foreign aid in Morocco represents less than 6% of the budget. And uh, of the budget of the, uh, the government, and it's around 1.3 if you uh, report it to the GDP. So it's not that significant. It's welcome. It's a, uh, around one billion dollars. Of course, it's welcome, and we would need more because we have some programs, especially in education, that we uh, where we would need more, uh, uh, more, uh, more aid, more money, and uh, that money can come from aid. But um, I think that uh, what is interesting to see is what happened, or what has happened in Morocco in the last five, five years, which is the result of what we have done in the last 20 years. Uh, last year, this year, we, uh, in 2008, we had a 6.5% of uh, growth. This year, they're predicting 5.8% of growth with the crisis and everything. So that's very interesting. <coughs> it's also because we have had a very good uh, agriculture year. We had, had, we've had a lot of rain and compensated 
uh, the problems that we, we've had uh, with the exports and, uh, and everything else. Uh, so um, the, also something interesting in 2007, 2008, we had the surplus on the budget, which is helping us today to face the crisis, the world crisis. So how did we do that? I mean, how did we achieve the, um, uh, reach these, uh, these achievements? Basically, in the, the beginning of the 90s, I mean, in the 80s, we went through, through the um, structural adjustment. Many countries went through that. And we made a, a lot of reforms that led us to a good, um, uh, good ma macroeconomic indicators. You know, today we have, uh, <clears throat> As I said, uh, the, uh, a significant growth, um, low uh, inflation has been less than 3%, um, and uh, the budget, the surplus of the budget, all this is uh, significant for the economy. But also with what we have decided in the beginning of the 90s was to go to put the economy, the Moroccan economy, in the international trade. And uh, because we figured out that it was impossible for Morocco to become to have a strong economy if we uh, stayed where we were uh, with a protection, um, uh, with a, an econ a protected economy. During 40 years, or 35 years, the economy of Morocco was protected. And uh, instead of, you know, taking the advantage of this protection to have a strong, strong industries uh, like uh, Korea did in the, in the 70s, uh, well, actually, what we what uh, we we achieved was a, a, a rent economy. Basically, the, the, our industry, our uh, our um, uh, companies were not uh, competitive and were not productive. So we thought that the best way to become a real and strong economy was to open our market and to open to the international trade. We joined the GATT, and then, uh, of course, the WTO which, by the way, was born in Morocco in 1994 in Marrakesh. We lowered our uh, custom fees. And if you look at the numbers, I think uh, in uh, 1993, uh, the custom fees uh, reported to uh, on importations, on imports, were uh, about 18.5%, today they are 4.3%. We decided to sign um, FTAs. FTA with Europe, with the United States, and with uh, several Arab countries, and among which Jordan, and uh, Turkey. Today, 90% of our foreign trade is with, with the, uh, within the FTAs, which is very important. Now, these FTAs, and um, when we lowered our custom fees, what happened is that our imports, our balance of uh, import ex export, um, actually we're importing much more than we are exporting. But what we are, we are uh, importing is uh, mainly um, equipment, uh, you know, machines, mm -hmm. the, which, which are uh, helping to the economical development. And at the end, it will, of course, um, help our exports. Uh, what is uh, also uh, very important that has happened in Morocco was the liber liberalization of the economy. Mainly, for instance, I can give you an example, uh, telecommunications. That was key for the development of the Moroccan economy. Uh, today, Morocco is one of the centers of uh, call centers around the world and uh, offshoring. And that's because of telecommunications. Two thirds of the, the Moroccan population is, um, has a, a phone, has a telephone, and that's important. But, and we couldn't have had <coughs> the investments that we've had in the last uh, 10 years, <coughs> had we not uh, liberalized the, the economy and especially telecommunications. The, uh, the growth of telecom telecommunications in Morocco is around, it's two digits, has been two digits in the last 10 years, which is very important. Uh, now, the, um, so, so the, the, in the, uh, for the crisis, and I think that shows what happened uh, and uh, how uh, diversification is so important. Uh, the, according to the World Bank and the IMF, Morocco is the, uh, the country of the MENA region that uh, addressed best, better the, the, uh, the crisis. 
Uh, why? Because we have a very diversified economy today. Textiles, industry, um, um, tourism, uh, aerospace industry. Today, uh, in 2000, there was not a plant on the aerospace industry, and today we have 7,000 7, people working in the aerospace industry. Uh, you have, of course, high-tech, uh, tourism, um, agriculture, agro-industry. Um, so we have a pretty diversified uh, economy, which helped us not to be sh hit by, you know, the, the crisis last year and uh, the beginning of, of this year. The financial sector was completely uh, liberalized, but also, thanks God, we had we have a, a currency control, and uh, the banks could not and did not buy toxic stuff, <laughs> <laughs> so they are in pretty good shape, uh, and that's. Uh, the, that's a, a good result. So the economy is doing pretty well today because of its diversification. So no oil industry. Foreign aid is rather low, small, small but we have challenges. <coughs> and what are the challenges? And we have serious and real cha challenges. The challenges are on the social <coughs> side of, um, let's say, the, the Moroccan fabric. Uh, first of all, education. We still have uh, I think that the numbers, they gave me the numbers yesterday, and 39% uh, of illiteracy. Why? Because Morocco is a big country and you have a lot of people spread out around the country in the mountains. It's very difficult to uh, reach to every village. You know, we have villages of 50 people, 60 people, 100 people. It's very difficult. Today, we have 90% of the children at the age of school at school. You have the problem of the quality of education, and that's a real challenge. Um, so, uh, for instance, why is it a challenge? So we, 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 we are addressing this issue of education, and one of the big challenges is how, when you have such a growth in the economy, you need people to make, it, to make the economy grow. And, um, but you lose competitivity if you don't have, for instance, enough engineers, because if you have you know, the supply and demand, and you have one engineer is uh, working in a company that I mean, he's working well in a company, but other company pays him 10% more, he will go to the other company. So the, the country becomes less compet competitive. This is why we have decided and the, the government decided and launched the program of um, training of 10,000 engineers with the, uh, by 2015. And that's important. And in other uh, tourism, last year, uh, this year, 2009, we have 20,000 more beds, meaning more hotels, more uh, resorts. Well, you need people to manage all this, and you need people to, so if we need training. We have schools, but they are not enough. So that's one of the challenges. Poverty, if you travel, those who have been to Morocco, you can see big differences. You go to Casablanca, and uh, you, go, you have the first world and the third world living side by side, and that's bad. But we, so we created, we launched in 2005 the Human Development uh, National Initiative. It's basically to address the question of poverty and to, to reach out to the poor people around the region, especially in the rural areas. The rural areas are, of course, 60% of the, the poor people are in the rural areas. So um, that's one of the, the big challenges also. So we have this, uh, this um, uh, national initiative for human development, and uh, between 2006 and 2010, uh, the government will spend one billion two hundred million dollars, but with small projects, uh, really reaching out to people in the villages, and um, that's to address the, the gap, the social gap that we have in the country. So those are mainly the the the. Uh, the main challenge is it's more pulling up the people who are living in the third world to the level of the people who are living in the, in the um, first world. Uh, we, what, what you can see also in Morocco <coughs> is that um, you have a middle class that is growing. Another factor which is very important, by, through liberalization and opening the economy, it led to op the political opening because the rules of the game are known Everybody, uh, you have equal chances. So um, it was easier to democratize. 
So, but we have still, I'm telling you, we still have challenges. The challenges are mainly poverty, although we, uh, the rate of poverty in the country was 15%, 14% uh, in 2003, and today it got down to 9%. And also the, the, the problem of, of unemployment. Globally, unemployment dropped to uh, less than 10%, but globally. Mm -hmm. if, but if you go to the countryside, you will see much, a much higher uh, problem, of, uh, I mean, problem of unemployment. So 9%, it's not bad, it's a good number, but it's not really uh, equally uh, spread in the country. So, those, so you have challenges, but the, the main, what we have done was uh, trying to diversify the economy through liberali uh, liber liberalization and opening the economy of the country. And it has paid off. Good. Green, please give us some of your experiences. Sure, uh, Don, thank you. When we look at our region, we should always bear in mind uh, also the cost of conflict. Uh, the conflict uh, in the Middle East has had an economic cost that has been estimated based on a report that was published uh, in May um, that estimated that cost to be $12 trillion since 1991. And that's a huge cost of course, that takes into account the destruction caused by the conflict of assets and so on, but it also takes into account the lost opportunity cost. So when we look at uh, the, this region in particular, we need uh, that, uh, uh, that backdrop uh, to be able to frame the issues. So therefore, when we talk about the reliance on uh, foreign aid, so Jordan, as Ambassador McQuarr mentioned, has no oil or gas, uh, and we have another problem, which is a refugee problem. Out of a population of six million, we have an estimated two million Palestinian refugees. We have an estimated million Iraqi refugees. So the cost of, uh, and on our infrastructure uh, has been huge that the government had to bear. So those are real and serious uh, challenges that we had to uh, deal with. Um, but when we look at what our government has done despite this, uh, when we talk about, uh, uh, I, I personally believe that oil is a curse and uh, the countries that have been uh, reliant on their oil reserves have not invested in their human capital, which is what Jordan has done. So Jordan probably leads in the region in terms of its literacy rate. Uh, which among the adult population is in excess of 92%, and overall it's in excess of 95%. But again, as Ambassador McQuarrie mentioned, and as uh, Chap mentioned, it's not just the issue of education, but the quality of education. So throughout the region, there's a big, big uh, disparity between the output of our education system and the needs of the uh, job market. So you find that discrepancy, and it tends to be quite huge. Um, now, in, in, in Jordan in particular, perhaps it's less so uh, than, than uh, the GCC countries. Uh, but still, in Jordan, unemployment uh, is above 14%, uh, which is high, and that is the official rate. The unofficial rate could be even higher. Um, and what we see when we talk about uh, unemployment, uh, in some countries, uh, we see foreign labor constituting the largest part of the workforce. Uh, and therefore, again, there are certain jobs that locals don't want to do, which I guess is not just restricted to our region, but through uh, even in the United States, uh, that is the case. So those are uh, issues that uh, we need to keep in mind. Um, what we have done uh, similarly is embarked on a privatization program, uh, which has been a realization over the past 10 years that government is not the best uh, the best body to run utilities. And uh, we have started that privatization program, whether it is our telecommunications or our utilities today, if we look at the energy sector, the energy generation and the energy distribution have been privatized. And that has allowed also for foreign investment to flow in, which again, I think here when we look at uh, uh, the foreign aid as opposed to investments. I think that's where we need to shift. So we're shifting from aid to trade, but also <laughs> to trade and investments. Um, but here, when we look at this from a US perspective, 
when we look at the cost of the war in Iraq, uh, which has probably exceeded a trillion dollars by now, uh, imagine if that amount or 10% uh, of it had been invested in, in investments with, with returns, not, not charity. I don't think the region is asking for charity as such, as much as investments in enterprises and not just in funds, but also in technology transfer. And I believe that is where we have, we have that base of, to, that can be cultivated uh, to allow such innovation uh, to take place. And uh, without specifying any uh, examples, but I think if you look at the region and in terms of the ICT sector in specific, there are some really breakthrough technologies uh, that have been developed that are coming out of our region, that are products and services that are being uh, sold throughout the world. Um, I'd like to uh, touch on just uh, the issue of energy in particular when it comes to oil. Um, uh, Jordan, of course, has no oil, so we import 96% uh, of our energy. So one, of course, we look at it from an energy security perspective, that we cannot be just reliant on uh, natural gas from Egypt, which is uh, the biggest supplier of natural gas, and which is uh, most of our energy generation is based on natural gas. Um, just like what happened between uh, Russia and Ukraine, uh, just closing that tap <laughs> can uh, strangle a country. And not that uh, that is an option. I believe Jordan's relations with Egypt are exceptional uh, and are very good. But the, this is where our focus, for example, today on renewable energy stems out of necessity. Uh, so today we have embarked on uh, wind energy as well as uh, solar, both uh, CSP and PV, and we believe there's huge potential there as the cost of technology drops uh, that we would also be able to provide uh, electricity to rural areas through a distributed energy generation system. But more importantly is to focus on innovation in this area. Uh, we do have some of the best sun in the world, and that's something uh, that uh, we need to tap as a resource. We are also rich in silica, and uh, those are the basic ingredients uh, together with uh, the know-how that can uh, provide solutions for this area. Uh, one country in particular, or one example, is in a GCC country, which is uh, the UAE and Abu Dhabi in particular. They have embarked on Mazdar. Yep. Uh, and I think that will be part of the discussion later. Mazdar is supposed to be a, new, a carbon neutral city. But what they have done as well is last week, they have managed to host the, to become the host for a newly uh, established organization called IRENA, which is the uh, International Renewable Energy uh, Association, which is the equivalent of the IAEA for nuclear power, uh, nuclear energy that would focus on renewables, uh, and Abu Dhabi has managed to attract that international organization to be based in an oil-rich country. And that is a message from the wise leadership of the UAE that's saying we cannot rely on oil and natural gas, and we know that is going to run out, uh, just as it has run out in uh, nation states such as Dubai. Dubai no longer has oil and relies on services and tourism, for example, to attract uh, uh, foreign investment as well as uh, revenues for their uh, budget. Um, so I believe there are some good examples that we need to follow, uh, but there are certain serious challenges as well. Uh, when we look at inter-Arab trade, that's trade between Arab countries, it stands at less than 8% of their overall trade. Uh, so if we take an example, Jordan enjoys a free trade area agreement with the United States. Our number one trading partner is the U.S. So we trade more across the Atlantic <coughs> than we trade with neighboring states. Uh, and that is, of course, due to several reasons. One of them uh, is conflict. So naturally, for us, Iraq should be our largest trading partner. But given the conflict and the war there, uh, that has been an impediment to that uh, development. Uh, so, so those are some of the issues that I believe uh, we need to address as well, but I agree fully that we cannot depend on oil for the future. We have to invest in our human capital. Uh, we have to focus on trade, and that's uh, hopefully all indications seem to be pointing in that right direction. 
Shep, uh, uh, Kareem has raised the question of conflict and insecurity in the region. And, and some of our data suggests that when you take oil out of the equation, that the return on investments in the Middle East, there's actually, you get a lower return than you do in other parts of the world. From the standpoint of a corporation that invests heavily, what are some of the factors that would cause your company or other companies to want to invest in the Middle East? What are some of the trade-offs that you see that could counterbalance mm -hmm. those problems? Well, I think on the positive side, there are both requirements for, in our particular case, our products, as well as the resources to a great extent to acquire them. Um, I don't think conflict, conflict comes into play and risk overall comes into play. Right. But beyond that, it is the nature of the human capital there, the skill base in terms of partnering. It is um, a judiciary that is both empowered and independent, such on things like contract law, that that is clear and transparent. It's a clear signal about property light, rights and intellectual property and how they'll be handled. Um, <clears throat> and then it's the ability just to be competitive there. So uh, we, we see the Middle East as a great and open market. We s acknowledge the challenges that are there. We are partnering with a number of countries and companies in the region on both education and technology development. Um, there are challenges as it relates to US um, uh, technology transfer laws. But in general, I think, and I'll use the word moderates, not trying to step on anybody's toes, but the moderate nations within the Middle East uh, are doing the right things, taking the right steps, investing in the right way in terms of open trade, in terms of financial transparency, and is a very attractive market for Boeing going forward. But to Kareem's point, uh, Boeing or any country can't put an MRO in every country in terms of maintenance, repair, and overhaul. We can't have a technology center in every country okay. doing the same types of technology. And one of the things that would benefit us greatly if there was more regional cooperation so that we could cooperate in certain areas and markets that would serve the broader region versus just that country. And I think both the ambassadors are aware and both these countries are examples of enlightened leadership going forward, but that's, that's still a hang up for us. We only want one MRO in Jordan, one MRO in Jordan. <laughs> 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 Kareem, uh, part of what you've done over your career is to encourage um, job creation through a number of um, companies that you've helped to, to spawn. Last May, there was a, an investment conference in Bethlehem where we were looking at the issue of creating jobs for unemployed Palestinian youth so that they would have alternatives to despair and violence. And um, you've all talk, talked about the subject of education and how important it is, but it's important for those who get educated to have jobs as a result of that. I think one of the issues we see in the region is that there is education, but then you don't have those follow-on jobs. How can the countries of the region begin to address that issue as well as the need to educate more? Well, Don, I think that is the biggest security threat from within, from inside. It's young men in particular who are uh, well-educated that cannot <coughs> find jobs and are driven to extremism just because they are in that vulnerable a state, so providing jobs for those people is, is critical, uh, not only for the economy, but also for national security. Um, as such, uh, when we look at the ICT sector, inter information and communication technologies, uh, I believe there are huge opportunities, uh, especially when, we, when you look at uh, the Palestinian territories in particular, where uh, the movement of uh, people is uh, usually, it's, it's impaired, it's, uh, it's not the easiest to travel from one town to another, which might be half an hour drive, uh, it might take you half a day uh, to get to work. So that's, uh, this is where, and companies such as Boeing have relied on, um, on people working in their own uh, villages and towns using technology, whether it's through call centers, 
uh, or through uh, providing, doing this knowledge work right. at home uh, where they can be productive, they can work even longer hours if they wish, uh, they can serve the whole world. Uh, the whole world is their market uh, <coughs> out of their own uh, humble environment. Uh, and I believe that where for the uh, Palestinian economy, there could be huge opportunities there because the Pal Palestinians tend to be also very well educated and learned, even though uh, that has been affected by the, uh, recent, um, uh, uh, the recent surge in, in hostilities. But that is, that's uh, uh, potentially uh, a big uh, challenge because also when uh, Prime Minister Salam Fayyad mentioned that, that was prior to the war in Gaza. Yes. Uh, and that has certainly raised many question marks on your conflict uh, issue. Back, and that's again the lost opportunity. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to uh, ask the panel one more question and then I'll open it up to the, to the audience. We'd, we'd love to get your perspectives and your questions. There are microphones on either side of the room so that those of you who have questions, if you wouldn't mind going to the microphone and I will, uh, I will start calling on you shortly. Um, Aziz, uh, President Obama was in Cairo recently, and he, he said that, uh, I'll quote, he wants to deepen ties between business leaders, foundations, and social entrepreneurs in the United States and Muslim countries around the world. Let me start with you. What advice would you give to the U.S. administration as they try to develop these ties? Uh, how would you uh, advise them on ways to make this more successful? Well, I think that there are <coughs> already uh, contacts between uh, between business people in uh, in the Arab world, in the Muslim world, in the, and the, the United States. I would encourage to more contacts with, between the, so, uh, the civil societies, uh, the American civil society, and the for Morocco, the Moroccan civil right. society, and it it's working, and uh, we, we are seeing more and more of that, and I think it's very, very important. Of course, another thing which is very important is cooperation between universities. And uh, again, we are seeing uh, many American universities opening up um, in, in, the, in the region, uh, and uh, particularly, I think, in the Gulf region, but also in Morocco, we, uh, we have now uh, some uh, you know, very wealthy people who are putting together American-type universities with cooperation with American universities. So I think that's it's through cooperation, uh, through, um, uh, you know, building bridges, but uh, bridges between people who do the same things. And then we will put all this together and we will build up uh, something. Uh, I would like to go back to what Karim was saying about the regional integration. Sure. I think that's very important. That's key. And uh, uh, for instance, in the I mean, in the, the Middle East, uh, in the Near East, uh, they have problems of conflict, and, uh, and you know, and it has been going on for a long time. In the Maghreb, in the, the Maghreb and the North Africa region, we haven't had that, and we should have a real strong regional integration. Uh, Morocco today is, we have 35 million people. If you put together, and uh, the United States have a, has a free trade agreement with Morocco, but imagine that. If we had, you know, Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Mauritania, and maybe even the countries of the Sahel fully integrated, I mean, that would be another partner for, for, the, Ameri powerful. for the American, uh, American companies and the European companies. I would like to go back also to something that, uh, about the, the foreign direct investment. Um, it's very important. And the best way to do, uh, to attract foreign direct investment, and by the way, domestic investment is to have the, um, the country as business friendly as possible. And this is, that's the most important thing. You have to make things easier for people if you want them to do business. If, you, if not, it's not going to happen. Not the foreigners, not the, 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 the nationals. So those are the goals. I think that regional integration is key, absolutely key. When you are talking about 8%, you know, it's less than 3%, which is really, really low. What an American company, I mean, why should an American company come to Morocco to sell to 35 million uh, people? And maybe not even 35 million, we're talking about 10 million. This is why we, we, we decided to sign free trade agreements with 
as many countries as possible because you have to look at the free trade agreements as a, a base for investment, not only trade. When you produce something in Morocco or in Jordan, you can sell to the United States duty-free. When you produce something in Morocco, you can sell into Europe duty-free, mm -hmm. into the United States duty-free. But all this would have been much better if we could have a regional integration. So to go back to your question, I think that we have to put together business people, universities, research, everything, uh, everything together. Uh, in the questions that you sent us, uh, you were talking about the networks. People, I mean, our Moroccans, our Jordanians who are living in the United States, in Europe, uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, an, in, an enormous base here for cooperation. In, uh, uh, we have many, for instance, for Morocco, we have many Moroccans here in the United States in very key positions in companies, but also at the NIH mm -hmm. and other places. And what they want, they come to see me and they tell me, what can we do for the country? Now you build the bridges with those, that's an enormous asset for the Jordanians, I, I suppose it's the same. Absolutely. And we should use them as much as possible and they want to be used. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, to the point on Please. regional integration, when you think globally, the competition is China. Yes. The competition is India for investment. Mm -hmm. The competition is other blocks of hundreds of millions of people that are also investing, and that's why all the more reason to come together. Right. Karim, do you want to <coughs> comment on that? Well, I think perhaps just one point also that we are in the Mediterranean region, and recently the uh, EU announced the Union for the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And one aspect of this is, for example, generation of, uh, of renewable energy or clean energy from the MENA region and uh, transporting that electricity to Europe uh, where Europe uh, also has set very high targets to reach uh, 20 uh, 20 percent of their energy from renewables to cut emissions by 20 percent and to uh, reach 20 percent efficiencies by the year 2020 so that is a big target and this is where that cooperation also can help because that's when we look at the, the regional grid today there are eight countries that have uh, their electricity grids connected but that gets disrupted. For example, we're connected Jordan to Egypt, uh -huh. but then through Libya, there is no connection to the Maghreb. Right. Uh, and that's where, again, such cooperation uh, can have uh, real fruit. Great. All right, let's take a question from the audience on this side. Uh, hi, Shelley Porges from Washington, DC. Um, thanks so much for this uh, really insightful briefing. Um, Two thoughts. One, uh, you talk about the, you know, obviously necessary provision of jobs for men. I should also say I'm chair of an organization called Count Me In for Women's Economic Independence. And while our focus today is on the U.S., we're about to meet with the State Department and others on some international efforts. You have not commented much on the entrepreneurship. And I recently came back from Marrakesh, as Ambassador Mekwara knows, and uh, was really impressed by, you know, really the entrepreneurial spirit of the people. In our last recession in the U.S., small businesses created over 500,000 more jobs than large businesses, which were then contracting and, in fact, are today. What is the role of entrepreneurship, specifically in the Middle East, in terms of providing jobs and providing um, some of this in economic stimulus? And uh, related to that, what is the role of women as you're educating more people? Obviously, in your countries, I know that includes uh, more young girls, more women. Um, some other countries, it's not as pervasive, perhaps, but what do you see as the role of both small businesses and, and specifically of women um, go, going forward in, in helping promote, you know, a, a economic growth in the region? Great. Uh, well, you touch on very important uh, issues. One, in terms of uh, entrepreneurship, I believe the Middle East in general is very entrepreneurial. Uh, throughout history, they were the traders, the merchants, and they have started all those small businesses, the bazaars, and uh, all this uh, trade that happens. Uh, but today, to start a business in the Middle East, you face many obstacles. And I, here I'm generalizing, because of course this differs from one country to another. But certainly, those obstacles need to be reduced so that it's easy to register a company to get it started without having to deal with the bureaucracy and the red tape that usually hinders such development. Uh, so today we see countries that are focusing more and more on the small and medium enterprises. 
But the other issue, equally important, if not more important, is the role of women. Because today, in, uh, for example, in Jordan, uh, more than 50% of our college students are women. Uh, but many of them who do get degrees do not go into the workforce. Uh, one, whether it is uh, culture or it's social or it's um, sometimes prejudice that stops women from participating. There are very few women CEOs that had uh, some companies, but there are some that are really exceptional and we're very proud of them. Uh, but also for women in particular, I think the, the trying to balance between uh, the, the requirements or the family role uh, and the career move, that is always a challenge as well. But throughout the region, we have a serious problem with women participation in our economy, which is a huge deficit. Uh, one thing that I did not mention is the Arab Human Development Report, which was published by the UNDP in several volumes, but it touches particularly on gender issues and the women plight throughout the Middle East. Um, for the uh, small and medium enterprises, I think that uh, we are focusing very much, pretty much on uh, those uh, companies because they are those who create more wealth and, and jobs. And uh, we um, and the government has been trying to put together uh, funds of guarantees for this because they had some difficulties to, to get loans from the banks. And today, I think the, if I was reading the paper, and it seems that today to find a company get to finance itself, I mean, the cost of financing is dropped down to 6%, but there is a fund of guarantee for um, the medium and the small companies. Uh, about the gender. Um, I'm sure that you know the, the ladies from the, um, the Association of Women Entrepreneurs of Morocco are really, really very dynamic and uh, very forthcoming. They, they are very strong and uh, they, are, they participate. We have an association of, um, of the, um, the, the companies in Morocco, industrial and the services companies, and they are very, very active there. But of course, as uh, Karim was saying, in the education we have it's more or less the same rates. We're talking about 50 to 53 percent of uh, the students are women, and uh, we still need to see more involvement of women uh, in, uh, uh, in the, the workforce, but also in, um, in the companies and uh, creating companies. But we have this AFM, which is a very, very strong and very active uh, organization. You know, Don, if I could, not Please. from the region, if I could just comment as a traveler too and someone that does business in the region, <clears throat> the demographics will not be denied in the Middle East. So women are coming into education, uh, obviously in Jordan and Morocco in terms of business, but UAE where you can look to Sheikh Alubna, for instance, they're very focused. You can go to uh, King Faisal University in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia and find out that three or four of the department heads there are women. So I think it's taking time, but I think that there's a realization, not just that it's charitable, but that the intellectual capital there, the gene pool there, is much, much uh, benefiting that region going forward. Good. Question from this side. Yes. Kareem and Aziz, I was wondering what you thought should be done to bring peace to the Middle East. <laughs> and how that would change economic cooperation among the different countries. In two words or less. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> 140 characters. Um, I believe uh, there's, there has been uh, an agreement that has been reached uh, under the Clinton administration, and that's what we'll ultimately go back to, which are known as the Clinton parameters. Uh, of course, the two parties, primarily the Israelis and the Palestinians, have to agree on the, to the final details. I believe also the uh, Arab uh, countries have presented the Arab peace proposal in March of 2002, uh, and that's certainly something that needs to be taken advantage of. Uh, and I believe with President Obama's uh, drive towards peace in the region and with all the officials that we've heard, uh, I'm quite optimistic that something could be achieved soon. Uh, of course, I agree 100 percent with what Karim was saying. Uh, we have some tools and some bases uh, to build up um, 
uh, peace in the, in the Middle East, especially between the, the, the Israelis and the Palestinians. I'd like to add something, just something. If the Israelis want a two-state solution, and I think that everybody agrees on the two-state solution, I think that Israel has to, um, to make it happen. And to make it happen by helping the Palestinians to create the, uh, their own state. I think that uh, it's not about sitting across the table, it's uh, being of the same team. You know, I don't know if you understand what I mean. Uh, they should not sit across the table with the Palestinians, they should sit together and say, how are we going to make it happen? And I think that they can really help. If, if with that mindset, maybe we can reach uh, a solution pretty quickly. Great. Don, if I may add, I believe also the creation of a Palestinian state has to focus on a state that is viable and that is economically uh, prosperous one so that we help the Palestinians stop seeing it greener on the other side of the fence. Good. Question. Thank you for all the development you're doing. And um, as Kareem knows, I, Jordan's one of my favorite places in the world. I love the people and women are very educated and looking forward to going to Morocco. I'm not sure how to ask this with all the respect that I feel and um, to do it in a delicate way. But um, how, can you, how can you have sustainable economics when the population is growing so fast in the Middle East? And when, you know, all religions have their pluses and minuses, but are there clinics the government can set up? Um, in India, I know they're dealing with um, you know, birth control issues, and I think that will help India. Does this have to be a slow process by the middle class emerging, or is there something that the governments or can do more actively, or will it step on the religious toes too much? Aziz, let me start with you. Well, uh, about the growth of the population. Uh, if you look at the numbers, in the 60s, uh, I'm talking, I would talk about Morocco, in the 60s, we had 3.3% uh, of population growth. In the 80s, we had a 2.2% uh, population growth. In 1999, I think we had the census and they showed that we, the population growth was 1.4%. So you see a dramatic drop in the uh, population growth. Um, 1.4% is, uh, is a good number, it's a perfect number. But we have to be very careful, you cannot go below that. And it, uh, the 1.4% shows that we have maybe a window of 20 years to become a real economy and to develop the country because you cannot develop, become a real economy with an aging population. And the Mor Moroccan population is aging. The number, I think that the percentage, I don't have the numbers, but the percentage of people over 60 today in Morocco is pretty high. So, you know, you're talking about the growth of the population. There is one danger, and I think this is something that uh, in all the conferences everybody talks about, is uh, the long trends of demography and you seeing a reduction of population. Of course, in Europe is a dramatic in the United States less because of immigration, but even in our countries, and I'm talking about Morocco, we are 1.4%, that's really the threshold. But I was talking more about the Middle East in general, ah. sorry. Well, 1.4% is very impressive, um, and I think you need 2.2% just to maintain the population size the way it is. 1.4%. 2. No, one point four. It's okay. Two point two is the number of children per week. Okay. Per women. Uh, we have in Jordan uh, families with the average number of children in excess of six. Uh, that's very high. The population will double in twenty years, and certainly it's not sustainable when you look at our water resources. Uh, Jordan is the fourth poorest country in its water resources. Uh, countries uh, throughout the uh, Arabian Peninsula have. Uh, uh, opted for desalinization of uh, seawater. And uh, actually that uh, market alone constitutes 60% of the desal market in the world. So a lot of focus on that, but certainly there are environmental issues that need to be taken into consideration. Uh, the focus, yes, religion is a challenge, uh, just like the Roman Catholic Church uh, in Islam, it is a challenge, uh, but 
there are solutions. You take a country, Morocco is, a, is of course a Muslim country, but take another country such as Iran. They have also successfully brought down uh, the population growth rate. So there are some examples. There are good examples from Iran that we can learn from. Uh, but one issue in particular in Jordan that we have been focusing on is birth spacing, so that at least uh, the mother would be more conscious of, uh, of having more breathing space uh, between every birth, which is, of course, results in a healthier family overall. I would like just to add something about the religion. You know how, I, this is an anecdote, how we uh, reached the 1.4%. In the 70s, a religious scholar wrote a long report explaining why family planning was perfectly um, uh, agreeable to, to Islam. And he was a very well-known religious scholar. So from then on, the, um, the Moroccan authorities just you know, distributed pills all around the country, and of course the women took them. <laughs> and there was no religious issue, because you had this very important religious scholar who said it's perfectly okay. family, family planning is okay. Question. Hi, I'm Carol Fotino, and I find it very fortuitous that the two uh, countries in the region that have the most tested paradigms for non-oil-based economies are present for my question because I come from a background, I run two organizations and they both work on uh, conflict and one works with the oil and gas industry, but they both work from the, the standpoint of economic development, strategic economic development. And what our studies have shown is that conflict is most easily eradicated through uh, sustainable, through economic opportunity and then making that strategically sustainable. So what I see through that perspective is that the country most invested in Palestinian economic success in the region is Israel. And so what I'm thinking is, and I'm wondering if there's a possibility for, is the two countries here represented have already had very tested, non-oil-based uh, economic development. And I see a very uh, unique opportunity for these two, two countries, as well as perhaps the US, to work with Israel to create a more strategic, sustainable economic opportunity and uh, development environment for Palestinians, not just Palestinian youth, but Palestinians in general, and have a, an effect on the conflict there towards a more successful result. What are, what are your thoughts on that kind of an approach to that situation? Well, uh, as you're probably aware, Jordan has a peace treaty uh, with Israel that was uh, signed in 94. Uh, and it has, it has addressed uh, many issues. Uh, so there is, there is cooperation uh, between Jordan and Israel, but frankly, it has been limited because of uh, the, the development between the Palestinians and the Israelis, uh, even though there's a lot of trade that happens between them. Uh, but some of the challenges that we face uh, for example, trying to export Jordanian products to the West Bank uh, market, which is estimated to be about a $4 billion market. The Jordanian exports do not exceed $20 million out of that $4 billion. So there have been restrictions. Today, every single commodity that you want to ship to Israel needs the approval of their Ministry of Commerce, which is very restrictive and it's very bureaucratic. Uh, and, you know, thinking that uh, the Israelis are very pragmatic when they want to be. They can easily establish a list of, of commodities that are not allowed. So for example, if fertilizers is an issue or of concern, they can say that is a product that cannot be exported to the West Bank, but then allow every other product to be sold rather than to get approval on a commodity, on a, on a line item basis. Uh, so there are, those are uh, some of the issues that need to be addressed. But uh, to be also fair to some of our Israeli friends who are uh, promoting investments and they are taking the lead also in investing in the Palestinian economy. Uh, and there are many of them that uh, have done remarkable work there as well. Zisa, I think this goes to your point earlier that by working together in a collaborative fashion, particularly if you focused on something like um, economic growth, 
uh, you might get uh, faster progress. Is that kind of what you had in mind? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly it. Uh, as for uh, Israel, well, first of all, we are far away from the, from the region, and uh, we are not as linked uh, with the problems of the region. But just to say, I think that um, uh, with Israel, it, Morocco has a, a particular situation because there are something like 600,000 uh, Israelis of Moroccan origin, so you have something like 45,000 coming every year to Morocco, visiting Morocco. And of course, there is, they do some trade and, uh, and business there. But it's not something that is going on. So, so critical, yeah. Question. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Simon Bomi, and I'm a Bezos scholar from Kalamazoo, Michigan. And uh, my primary question uh, revolves around foreign assistance, or as Madeleine Albright would call it, uh, national security assistance. And uh, as we see the great work uh, by the Boeing company investing in uh, and the diversification of these uh, businesses and not totally focusing on the oil industry. Uh, can you guys maybe foresee a reduction in uh, US foreign assistance or it, are you, we gonna see more increase and uh, take into account the US economy and as uh, our you know, economy is more stretched out you know, with our healthcare systems uh, affecting everything? Uh, yeah, let, me, let me go first and posit this. <coughs> Foreign assistance, national security assistance, is useful uh, as a means of a foreign uh, affairs, foreign relations tool. I would argue to you that, uh, back to Kennedy's statement that you know a rising tide lifts all uh, boats, that given the global nature of the economy, it is really close commercial ties that will far transcend over the long term any foreign affairs bill that gets through Congress at any point in time to dole out a certain amount of money. I'm not taking away from that, but if you look 20 years down the road, much more of it should be based on commercial common cause, collaboration and partnership among industries in a global world, uh, and that foreign assistance or national security assistance is very focused on specific challenges, threats of education, health items like that, rather than being the basis for a relationship between the United States and any other country. Green, your thoughts? Well, when you look at it, as Don mentioned earlier, $82 billion over 10 years seems so insignificant to the deficit of the United States. Uh, and I believe cutting that aid is not going to uh, make a dent uh, in the U.S. budget. On the other hand, if you look at it from the recipient's side, it certainly goes a long way in, in, in providing uh, the basic life necessities for many. Uh, so if you look, one organization in particular is UNRWA that has been, uh, that has been providing support for over six million Palestinians in the diaspora, and that's providing basic health care, basic education, life sustenance. And uh, for, for those, imagine if you, if you do cut that financial assistance, uh, what would happen to those people? Uh, and the U.S. has always been a leader in extending a hand, and uh, recently there have been also measures that have been introduced uh, looking at pushing countries that are receiving foreign assistance to also uh, focus on certain indicators uh, that help in reform in, in pushing those countries in the, in, in the right direction. But I'm, uh, I'm certainly f for uh, supporting, uh, maintaining that level of support and not cutting it on the contrary, looking at other instruments such as investments. And here perhaps I would touch on one thing that the corporate sector is doing, it's corporate social responsibility mm -hmm. that has been uh, growing in, in the region. So corporations, mm -hmm. uh, Boeing I believe has a report mm -hmm. on uh, their CSR program and, and many in the region have been focusing, taking on their, their responsibility as corporate citizens in helping uh, support those that are in need. Okay. Karina, if, if I could, I, I'm not advocating that you cut specific aid for specific purposes. I'm just saying in terms of a global economy and what Jordan, Morocco, or the Middle East wants to accomplish, those amounts of money uh, will get subsumed in what should hopefully be a larger commercial economic collaboration. Sure. So if I have a chance in Congress to lobby for uh, or argue for more open and free trade agreements, uh, not to the exclusion of foreign assistance, 
but that's where I'd like to see more emphasis because the benefits in the long run can be greater. Absolutely, and I believe some countries in Africa would say, uh, let's look at the subsidy. For right. example, when you look at agriculture in right. particular, it's very difficult for African countries to export their produce just because farmers uh, and producers <laughs> in the developed world get so much subsidy mm -hmm. uh, that the African countries are unable to compete. So if you level the playing field, uh, then that can go a long way as well in promoting trade of such basic products. I would just like to add to this point that I think the United States is moving in the right direction with regard to the nature of its assistance. There will always need to be the support that uh, an Iraq situation will require or a Palestinian situation will require. But for example, in both Morocco and Jordan, the Millennium Challenge Corporation is looking at it from the standpoint of how do we help these countries help themselves right. so that the aid is targeted to make that kind of add-on effect mm -hmm. as opposed to being a dependency or creating an alternative mechanism. Mm -hmm. The Global Development Alliance program that USAID sponsors that mm -hmm. joins with companies like Boeing to work together to achieve a mutually supportable mm -hmm. kind of programs I think is another uh, avenue that's moving in the right direction. So I think there are progress in, uh, along these lines. Let's see, I think we're back here on the yeah. questions. Um, my name is Satoshi Ikeuchi from the, the University of Tokyo. Um, I want to ask about the you know, meritocracy in the Middle East, and the, especially in the Arab world. You know, I think the, the problem, it, it's a very old problem, and uh, I think it's still a problem. In, uh, I think um, the, the one of the very important factor in the, the uh, development in the East Asia, and in general, and uh, Japan in particular, was the, you know, the meritocracy is the one, one of the most important standards in promoting people. I've been um, I spent much time in the Middle East, and mainly Egypt and Jordan, um, spending some time with you know ordinary Arab friends. They are very you know working hard and studying hard and getting high marks in their universities, but they cannot be you know promoted because they do not have enough connection. You know, so I think this point, you know, lack of meritocracy sit in the center of many problems in the Middle East, I think. And uh, if you want to bypass this bottleneck of the lack of meritocracy and want to have some influence and some change you know, into your society, you know, for ordinary Arab uh, students, there are only two options. One option is, you know, ironically, um, you know, some many, many times, conflicts uh, make room for some meritocracy. If you are very good at using your guns, you're, you're promoted in some, in certain kind of situation. And if you are very good at instigating people with rhetoric of you know, radical Islamic ideology, you are in a way promoted. And the other way is you know, kind of another program of intervention, for intervention. If you some way want, went to you know, go to Washington DC and some you find you know some connection very very good connection you may have some you know influence by you know uh, pressuring from outside and so intervention and the conflict you know the, the, the big problems in the Middle East I think the, in this in this problem uh, it, it is related you know they are related to lack of meritocracy. Well, there must be a meritocracy or we wouldn't have Kareem and Aziz here. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. I, meritocracy is, is an ideal that we uh, seek to, to uh, attain in, in Jordan. And uh, over the past 10 years, His Majesty King Abdullah has been uh, very much focused on this point and in many of our ministries. This is more of a problem in government than it is in the private sector. We have changed, uh, so today, promotion guidelines so some junior officers get promoted uh, and bypassing their seniors uh, which is rocking the boat in, in some way 
uh, but I also believe in, in the private sector today, it's uh, job recruitment uh, websites are very prevalent. Uh, so today that's uh, neutralizing the employment market in terms of at least the application process. Uh, where many people get the opportunity to be considered and that's based on their qualifications because again what you get electronically is basic uh, data rather than uh, a picture or uh, a, you know, a family, uh, family reference exactly uh, so it, it, I would say it's moving in the right direction but this is not also a problem that's restricted to Middle East mm -hmm. even from my humble experience here in, in the US there is nepotism uh, as well, sometimes in government, uh, without specific examples, but also <laughs> in, uh, even, even in, there are corporate politics uh, within corporations. Uh, people don't just get promoted based on qualification, but on other issues. Don't look at me. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'm going to have to uh, stop the questions here with apologies to those who are, are left standing, uh, because I'd like to give our panelists uh, an opportunity to kind of wrap up your thoughts around this topic. If the question is, can there be a path to sustainable economies in the Middle East, what is your prognosis? Do you, over the next 10, 15 years, see uh, things really moving in the direction that you've been, been teeing up here? Aziz, I'll start with you. Well, I think that <clears throat> we have, a, we have a, a clear idea what should be done about what should be done. And that's very important. Two years, uh, four, five years ago, we, we published, um, I mean, 120 people looked around the country and, uh, they, published, um, and they published a, a report called the HDR 50 report. It was a picture about what had happened in the last 50 years in Morocco and what uh, went wrong, what went what went right. It's on the internet if you want to read it, it's HDR50, and it really focuses on the, on the problems and the, the issues. So we know what has to be done. So if we do it, the, the country will do well and uh, very quickly uh, we can see, uh, you know, if you, continue, uh, we, if you have a 6% economical growth in 10 years, you double your uh, GDP and uh, uh, and it, that can be done. It really can be done if you address all the challenges. I'm an optimistic man and I think that uh, it's doable and uh, it will be done. I believe with oil at uh, $70 a barrel and many of the GCC countries, uh, Saudi Arabia in particular, have budgeted at $40, uh, they will do uh, extremely well in the short term. I believe all eyes are on the Middle East in terms of its wealth. Uh, and today we see more funds and more corporations heading to our region uh, looking for uh, uh, investment opportunities as well as commercial opportunities. Um, on, the, on the other hand, uh, I believe countries have, should not take that for granted and should invest in, in developing its human capital. Um, we, in Jordan in particular, and in the audience, we have the author of the National Agenda, Dr. Marwan Moasher, uh, and that has been a plan for us that we continue to reflect on uh, to make sure that uh, we are on the right course in terms of the reforms. Uh, in terms of sustainable energy, I foresee huge development uh, taking place, uh, led by Masdar, among other programs uh, such as Idama and Jordan, uh, that can have significant impact uh, in the uh, months and years to come. And Shep, I, I again, think, you have a global perspective, right. so well, give so us I, that. I think whether you're a company or a country, acknowledging the problem is the first step, and I think that has occurred in the Middle East. I think the second part of that is trying to come up with the solution, and I think awareness about education, the need for it, and the quality for it will turn that growing cohort of young people from a challenge into an asset. That is what has happened in China. That is what has happened in India. So I see the right focus. The question will be the timing on it. Can it move quickly enough so that um, the Middle East positions itself to compete in a global economy against those very large and very dynamic uh, other regions that are also competing? But as is evidenced by the two leaders you have here today, there is acknowledgement and there's a lot of thought going into it. 
Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for very thoughtful comments and very informative discussion. I think on behalf of all of us, we've really appreciated it. Thank you.